What's up guys, this is going to be a really quick video on hemochromatosis and all of the important points that you need to know about this disease on various board exams in the field of medicine. So let's get right into this. First of all, what is hemochromatosis? So to begin, we need to know kind of some general anatomy of the gastrointestinal system and be able to understand where iron is absorbed. So to begin, this disease is dealing with iron, specifically this is excess iron in the body. So the mineral iron is being taken in too much from the small intestine. Where in the small intestine? Well, imagine that you take in food and it comes down from the esophagus and enters the stomach. And after being partially digested and broken down, it enters then into the small intestine over here. And right here, the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. The duodenum. This is the point of iron absorption. This is basically where in the body iron is absorbed, and that's just a symbol for iron, Fe2+. Okay, so in this disease, we're having an excess absorption of iron. We're having way too much absorption of iron in the duodenum. Well, what's the reasoning for that? The reasoning for this is because there's a mutation in a gene called HFE, the HFE gene. This gene normally controls basically how much of a molecule called hepcidin is produced. Hepcidin. So what, what does this hepcidin do? Well, let's go down here. This hepcidin actually will bind. So here's the iron, let's say, that's coming into the, um, from the small intestine into the uh, system, right, our blood. So this is the duodenum. Here's the iron going across. Well, when the iron enters from going from the lumen into the um, cells of the small intestine, these cells are called enterocytes. Once it gets into these enterocytes, so let's say this is an enterocyte that the iron has now entered into, it has to go through a transporter right here. And this transporter is called ferroportin, ferroportin, ferroportin. So the way I kind of keep this straight that this transporter is here is because at the, if you look at this word port, you know, like ferries have to go through a port, a port of entry, like a port to get somewhere. So before the iron can ever get into the blood, it has to go through a port, the ferroportin, okay? And this transporter is what is responsible for controlling how much iron is going to enter into the blood to eventually bind to a protein called transferrin. Okay, and then this iron that is now bound to this transferrin is going to go and go and go into the liver, where the, that's the main uh, place that a lot of it is is kept at, and it is going to be stored in the liver within the hepatocytes uh, bound to a plasma protein called or a protein called ferritin. Okay, so how do you keep these three terms straight? How do you keep ferroportin, transferrin, and ferritin? I already told you the tip about ferroportin, that that is the port of entry, basically, and you know that iron cannot enter into the blood or into the waters before going through a port of entry. Then transferrin, well, that just has, that even has the word transfer in it. That's pretty easy to remember. And then if you can remember those two, there's only one left, and it's ferritin, and that's just one that I would always have to try to remember kind of by a process of elimination. Do you know the other two? Then you know the three. So that's all besides the point. So we are getting, basically we're taking iron in and it's using this ferroportin to kind of regulate how much iron comes in. The problem is that if this HFE gene, which is responsible for producing hepcidin, if this HFE gene is messed up, that means that hepcidin Hepcidin's normal function is to bind these ferroportins, ferroportin, so it'll bind this ferroportin and degrade it, okay? It binds onto it and it basically takes, it'll take that ferroportin and bring it inside the cell and then break it down. So you can imagine that increase, so a lot of hepcidin is going to result in decreased levels of ferroportin and we need ferroportin to regulate the amount of iron that comes in from that enterocyte or that intestinal cell at the duodenum um, into the blood. 
So what happens if this HFE gene, which is responsible for producing hepcidin, is messed up? Well, now we have decreased hepcidin. And decreased hepcidin is going to lead to way too much ferroportin. And all of this ferroportin that is not that is basically not being degraded and not being regulated is now just going to allow tons and tons of iron um, into the enterocyte and then of course um, from the enterocyte into the blood to basically overwhelm this whole system and we're going to have massive stores of iron. So that's how this disease works. So let me clean up the screen a little bit and just remind you now some of the core details. So the food comes in that has the iron, it goes through the stomach, it reaches the duodenum, the beginning part, and it goes and it uses this ferroportin transporter to go from the intestinal cells and it binds transferrin. Then when it reaches into the blood, this transferrin goes to the liver where it will drop off the iron and then it, the iron will then bind to ferritin and that's how it is stored in the body. It's stored via binding to ferritin. Okay, so now that we know that and we know that this is a disease of excess iron in the body, let's look at some lab results of how this would present on a lab panel, okay? So I already told you what ferritin is. Ferritin is the iron store, the iron store protein for the body. So in other words, that is how iron is stored. Anytime it reaches the liver, it needs to bind to ferritin. Thus, when you have a ton of iron, what would happen to ferritin? Well, of course, you would have increased ferritin levels to accommodate for all of that ferritin. So on a lab panel, you're going to have an increase in ferritin levels. What about serum iron levels? Well, this is common sense. Of course, serum iron levels will be increased. So you'll see an increased serum iron level when you look at lab values. What about total iron binding capacity? So all this means is this. This is the ability or the capacity for iron to be able to be bound to something in the body, for example, and that something is going to be transferrin. So what this means is that when you have tons and tons of iron, tons and tons of iron that is entering into the blood and is binding to transferrin, just imagine that so much iron is coming in that the transferrin, there's not enough transferrin to carry it all. So what happens is, what that means is that the ability or the capacity of, of the body to, to bind iron and to carry it around in the blood has been decreased. We no longer have the ability to carry any more um, iron. So when you look, there's something called the TIBC or the total iron binding capacity. So our capacity to bind iron is going down. So that's a decrease. And then percentage saturation, that's the percentage saturation of transferrin. So in this one before where total iron binding capacity was the ability of iron to bind to some sort of transferrin in the body and hope that there's more ones open and available. In this bottom one, this is the percentage that that transferrin is all being bound up. So in this disease, you can imagine that every single transferrin is being overwhelmingly bound by all of this iron coming in. So you're going to have an increased level, an increased percent saturation. You can imagine almost all of the transferrins would be saturated and filled with iron as it transports it to the liver to be bound to ferritin. Okay. All right, so we're going to move into the next point, and this is now getting into how this is going to look on histology. So if you were to cut off a little piece um, uh, of the patient's liver, right, and take it in for biopsy, notice that you see these, this is a basic uh, liver sample here, and then notice how you see these like brownish dark areas within these hepatocytes. This brown dark area, this is basically clusters this is just clusters of that excess iron that is all kind of bound together. We're basically overwhelming the liver with too much iron because of all of that ferritin that is storing too much iron and you have these clusters of iron and the name for these clusters of iron in, in the tissues and organs of the body is called hemosiderin. Hemosiderin. Okay, now there's something really important to note is that this hemosiderin looks very similar to something that you may have heard before called lipofusin. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it correctly. Uh, hopefully that is lipofusin. And that presents as the exact same, it looks the exact same as this hemosiderin, these clusters of iron. How do you distinguish the two? And this is very important and this comes up on questions a lot. You use a Prussian blue stain. Prussian blue staining. 
And that's just a fancy stain. That's just a fancy way to say that this stain is going to stain basically all of these clusters over here that I'm talking about, all of these clusters of brown little granules um, that are these clusters of iron. When you do the Prussian blue, they are going to stain blue. Okay? Whereas, whereas lipofusin will not stain blue. Okay, lipofusin doesn't stain blue because this Prussian blue is specific for iron. Okay, so that's important to know. So basically, they could give you a picture like this and you're trying to figure out, oh crap, it looks like lipofusin and it also looks like it could also be hemosiderin and they could have an iron problem. So then the way to distinguish that, and you may see that in the question stem, it'll say something about the Prussian blue staining was applied and here's a picture. Now if you don't see any blue in the picture for these clusters then you know that we're dealing with lipofusin. Um, if you see blue then you know we're dealing with hemosiderin and most likely an iron uh, issue. Okay, So that's going to be how histology presents. Let's move now into some of the symptoms that you're going to see with this disease. So if I put just kind of to keep this all simple I deliberately put, let's start on the right side because this is very high yield. This is a pancreas Okay, the pancreas of the body, and this is the skin, just a little section of skin. Okay, so something that you see in these patients, in a high number of these patients in severe um, hemochromatosis is something called bronze diabetes, bronze diabetes. Basically, you can imagine that um, as you get more and more and more uh, iron depositing in various tissues and organs all over the body, it can begin to kind of change the color of certain organs, and that's exactly what happens with these two. You get a change of color. Notice that this skin looks very bronze-like, okay? You imagine that a patient had a different skin color than this, then all of a sudden they have this disease and it gets really severe and their skin turns all bronze colored. That is something called bronze diabetes. Well, why is it called diabetes? Because it also makes the pancreas turn bronze-like. So the color of the pancreas would be bronze tinted as well. And what also comes with the pancreas, besides just the discoloration, is that you damage the, um, the eyelets. Some, there's something in the pancreas called the islets, the pancreatic islets, or the pancreas islets, and this is the part of the pancreas that produces insulin. Now let me remind you that insulin, normally when you have insulin release in the body, it will decrease your blood glucose level. So if you're damaging the pancreas because of this bronze diabetes symptom that you see with too much iron being deposited, you're not having any insulin being released from the pancreas islets, and you're thus not able to lower blood glucose. So they will give you a presentation of a patient with bronze colored skin or darker colored skin out of nowhere all over their body, and then um, they'll tell you that the patient now has a blood glucose that's super high even though the patient didn't have diabetes before and they're trying to get you to think of this disease, hemochromatosis. Okay, let's get in the last two things. Of course, the liver is where the primary damage is gonna be seen, and that's where you're gonna to see tons of hemosiderosis. And remember how to tell that apart from the lipofusion is gonna be because of the Prussian blue positivity. Okay, it's gonna be Prussian. You're gonna see blue when you stain those little clusters of iron, which are called hemosiderin. Okay, so you're gonna have uh, liver damage and all sorts of, and they can be various types of uh, diffuse liver damage from that. And then the last thing you can have is neurological problems. I'm not going to put a specific type of neurological problem because it can vary. You can have behavior changes and all sorts of all sorts of issues happen uh, because of that. So those are the symptoms for um, hemochromatosis. And I think I've covered the majority of the important points to know for the test. Um, let me just kind of go over the main important things again. Like I said, what causes it? It's caused by an HFE mutation. And let me, I don't know if I remember I telling you this, but this is kind of really cool. When you look at HFE, I don't know why, when I was studying this, I never noticed this until recently. The HFE gene if you look and you break this down, H for hereditary, Fe for iron. Remember I said that Fe2 plus is the, like the chemical symbol for iron, and H stands for hereditary. So just looking at the gene, that's telling you that we're dealing with a hereditary problem with iron, or a hereditary iron overload, which is the definition of um, hemochromatosis. Okay, and, on, and one little last point, you can have a primary 
uh, hemochromatosis. Primary means that you are born with that problem. In other words, that problem is not caused by something else. So that so in primary hemochromatosis, that's where you have the HFE gene problem that we've been talking about. But you can have a secondary hemochromatosis. Secondary means that something else is causing there to be a lot of iron. But the problem is not because of this HFE gene and all that ferroport and whatnot. The problem is in secondary hemochromatosis, the main problem that you'll usually see is chronic blood infusions. Imagine that you're giving a patient blood over and over and over. What's going to eventually happen is all of those blood transfusions that you're giving, remember that the main component of blood is hemoglobin. And that's what carries oxygen to all the different parts of the body. Well, don't forget that iron is made up, is within the hemoglobin, in the heme moiety. There's something called a heme a component within hemoglobin. And you need iron to make hemoglobin, and you need hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So what happens is when you have chronic blood transfusions, imagine that all of this blood, these these red blood cells within the blood, have to then eventually die and be they die and then they get broken down. And they release this iron out. They release all that iron then um, out basically to be into your storage once it's, uh, um, let's say, taken to the spleen and broken down by the macrophages there. So those are the two important types, but you'll mainly get questions from this one most likely. Okay, so I hope this helped, and I will see you in another video. Bye, guys.